Hello, everyone. This is Ed Denzel, host of Unfound. I wonder if you will consider becoming a supporter of this YouTube channel. By pressing the join button below, you can receive, for just 10 cents a day, the video version of the podcast a day early. The Unfound Now episodes a week early. Daily video updates from yours truly. And cool emojis to use during the Monday night live show. Please consider it as you watch the following spectacular video. Thanks. Mary Alice Cox was a 54-year-old from Clarksville, Tennessee. She had one daughter and was a longtime McDonald's employee. On March 20th, 2004, Mary told her daughter over the phone that she would be walking to a local store to get cigarettes. Mary never returned. She was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. as I've spent talking about child disappearances and my aversion to covering them, unless very specific criteria are met, and you can check we haven't featured that many, I haven't until recently realized that Unfound hasn't covered that many old person disappearances either. And by old, I mean people over 50. Yes, that means I'm old. But seriously, out of over 270 cases now, the number is easily less than 20 for people who went missing, but who also were at least half a century in age. That's only 7%, despite this group making up 34% of the population as a whole. What makes this hard for me to understand is I don't have a reluctance, unlike child disappearances, to covering cases in this group, and I think Unfound has covered the ones we have done very well. Some possible reasons? Maybe not a lot of people over the age of 50 go missing. Maybe children of missing parents have a tough time talking about the circumstances and don't make themselves available to the media. Maybe due to the people's ages, disappearances in this demographic just aren't reported. And there aren't places, not even NamUs, that have these missing people on record. Well, with Mary Cox, we're going to get to ponder the reasons as we try to decide why she disappeared. What happens in the golden years? And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Linus' website, charlieproject.org. Mary Cox, even before she became a mother, had struggled with mental health issues. In fact, two decades before Mary's disappearance, she had wandered off more than once, but was eventually found and brought home. Due to this, Mary could not consistently care for her only child, a daughter, who was cycled between other family members and foster parents until she could live on her own. Yet, Mary began to take her medicine regularly and was able to keep a job at McDonald's and live on her own in a group home with no problems. So, on the afternoon of March 20th, 2004, Mary told her daughter over the phone that she would be walking to a local store to get cigarettes. This was a common occurrence, although maybe not a daily one. The expectation was that Mary would return within an hour. However, she didn't. People at the group home recognized this and alerted management. Searches for Mary were unsuccessful. She was never seen again. 
The only evidence that eventually popped up was that a fisherman in Clarksville found Mary's purse, with everything including her ID inside, floating downstream two weeks later as if the item had just been put in the water that day. In addition to her longtime mental health issues, Mary also had some physical issues that would not normally be associated with someone who is only 54. They will be discussed in the interview. So please pay close attention to that as you also try to answer these three questions during the interview. Number one, a store employee claims Mary reached the market that day. Why were there no eyewitnesses to her walking there? Number two, what are we to make of someone using Mary's grocery discount card a full year after her disappearance? And number three, could a woman who was kind of a frenemy to Mary know more than she is saying about Mary's disappearance? Mary's family is not sure what to think and is open to all possibilities. The guest for this episode is Mary's daughter, Connie Diffenderfer. Unfound news. My appearance at the University of Akron will not be happening. I think there was a mix-up in communication as to where I lived, which made getting there somewhat improbable given the circumstances. Maybe we can make it happen next semester. Next, if you haven't heard, a Weld County, Colorado jury found Steve Pankey guilty this past Monday. I have to say, I'm surprised. I really did not believe, given what I understand about the case, that 12 people together could get to the point of beyond a reasonable doubt, for Janelle's murder. Maybe that's why I'm in the information business and not the law business. Finally, the Unfound newsletter came out November 1st. Did you get it? If not, contact me at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks. Where you can find Unfound. On these following podcast platforms, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, and many others, especially outside the United States. The new podcast, Unfound Live, which comes out on Tuesdays, can also be found on these platforms. Social media sites, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the newest one, TikTok. Listener support sites, patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. The website, theunfoundpodcast.com. The email address, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. And please mention unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound, the daughter of Mary Cox, Connie Diffenderfer. Connie, welcome to Unfound. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, the listeners should know, of course, the viewers who are now watching this on YouTube uh, know that right before we got started, I was telling uh, Connie how I'm impressed with her little studio that she has there as a podcaster. Even I'm jealous of her setup there. So um, it's very nice. Uh, you have a very nice setup there, Connie. And thank you uh, for joining us on this episode. Let's start um, start here as we usually do when we have family members on Unfound. Let's just talk a little bit about your family. Of course, it's your mother's who is missing, but does she have any other children? Um, you know, what can you say uh, about um, being the daughter of Mary? And, and of course, I understand maybe there were some you know, issues maybe growing up with some of the issues that your mother had, and we'll get into that, but just talk about your family. How many children does she have? What can you say? It was just me. I was the only one that she ever had, so. Is that right? Your only That's child, short huh? short and simple. Yeah. All right, just uh, only child. Yeah. Okay. All right. And um, where did you, uh, where did you grow up? Um, was it just you your mother and maybe your father, it was just the two of you. And, and where did, where did you grow up at? 
I grew up in Nashville, kind of moved around a lot. My mom was never married to my biological father. She was married to someone else for a, for a period of time. And, mm -hmm. um, but they were divorced, I think, before I was even born. And uh, so he was never in my life who she had been married to, nor my biological father. So I lived part of the time with my mom. And so for a little bit of time, it was just us. But most of the time, I kind of got tossed back and forth, moved around between family members. Mm -hmm. And then even at some periods of time, I was in foster homes. Oh, I lived okay. with my grandmother for a while, some aunts and uncles, went back with my mom, and then just kind of rotated all the way through to I had, had graduated high school, really. Okay. Uh, so was this due to your mother's uh, struggling with some um, mental health issues? Yeah, she had uh, bipolar and paranoid schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Do she, you, uh, she loved me and wanted to, but she just wasn't able to take yeah. care of me. Was this something uh, that you believe is, uh, and I realize you're in the healthcare field, do you believe this is something that's genetic or or how would you explain it's something that runs in your family or would you say? Well, there's definitely some genetic links to it, um, to parts of that, not to all of it, but to parts of it there are. And she, I was told that when she was younger, she was just kind of different and mm -hmm. she sort of had some issues. And then when she was a teenager, it got more obvious. And then she had a few traumas that happened in her early adulthood life. And it's like with each trauma that she had, it just exacerbated her okay. issues that she had. So. Okay. Uh, the way, uh, of course, maybe when you became adult, maybe you started to understand this a little better. And once again, being that you're health, in the healthcare field, you, you probably have a lot of expertise in this area. But how would her behavior manifest itself? Um, what did she have the tendency to do that was maybe out of the norm for an average adult? What would you say? Okay. When she was on her meds, she lived pretty much a normal life. But like a lot of people with mental illness, she would get tired of taking the meds or she didn't like the way that they made her feel. She would tell me that they made her just sort of zone out and she didn't like that feeling. So sometimes she wouldn't take them like she was supposed to. And then other times new meds would come out. She would get a different doctor. They would want to try something different with her. And so it was just this constant cycle of she would be doing great. And then either she would go off of them or meds would change. And she would start to just talk differently. She, when, when that would happen, you could tell she would really talk a lot about the past. Mm. Okay. And just e even the language that she used would change. And you huh. could definitely see the manic side of her. Okay, like uh, maybe different words or just like the pace of her words, something mm -hmm. like that? Both. Definitely the, the pace would change, but also just she would use a whole lot more, let's just say foul language when she was really than she would otherwise. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So she, she would start using some flowery language. Okay. <laughs> um, when she was on her medication, though, you said she was, uh, you know, you maybe couldn't tell that she had this underlying issue. Um, did she have a job? Could she keep a job if she stayed on her meds? Or, you know, what was she doing uh, as an adult? Uh, maybe even after you got out of high school, how did she pay for things and what did she do with her life? Mostly she relied on SSI, but there were periods of time where she worked at other places. The longest I know that she ever worked anywhere was McDonald's. She had huh. a great job there. She loved it. She was employee of the month for, I mean, months, maybe wow. even years, and just really enjoyed working there. And so she was uh -huh. able to do that. She was able uh -huh. to function that way. What years do you think those were? Um, let's see, probably around 85, 86 to 88, 89. Okay. Okay. And once you became an adult and when she was on her medication, what kind of a relationship did you two have? Did you see her often? Did you maybe live with her uh, maybe after high school and maybe went out on your own? I mean, what kind of relationship did you have? Like I said, when she was on her medication and, you know, was somewhat clear headed. Yeah. Actually, we had a, a better relationship and saw each other more when I became an adult than we did when I was a child. She lived with me you know, on and off. Um, she lived uh -huh. with me for a little while, and then she had a boyfriend, and she lived with her boyfriend for a while. She moved back in with me for a while. Um, and she would live with me for periods of time, but whether it was, you know, that she met somebody and she wanted to do something else, or there was a couple times that 
she was kind of dangerous around my children. Oh, okay. And so that kind of brought some things up, just some things that she was doing like once, um, one of the last few times that she lived with me, last couple of times that she lived with me, she, my children just heard her talking to somebody that wasn't there mm. and it scared my children. Sure. And, um, so it's just kind of things like that, that I had to, yeah. you know, find, find a balance that worked for her, but that also worked for us. Right. And what would you say maybe the last year was that you two had lived together that she had lived with you approximately? Um, Let's see, like I adopted my daughter that's in the wheelchair. I adopted her in 2002. And mm -hmm. so I think maybe 2003. So, yeah. Okay. That's the last time she lived with us. Okay. In regards maybe to your mother's interests and hobbies, uh, you talked about her working at McDonald's, but once again, when she was on her medication and taking it uh, and it was doing well for her, what were some of her of her interests and hobbies? Maybe music or TV shows, and what are things that you know? What do you re you remember about her? The things that she liked to do. Yeah, she loved music. She loved Blondie. Um, she oh. loved to listen to Blondie music. One of her favorite songs was um, that that's not a Blondie song. Was Every Breath You Take. Wow, the police. She loved that song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, she loved to lay out in the sun to go for a walk. Strangely enough, she loved to iron. <laughs> Something I did not inherit from her, but wow. she loved to iron and just watching TV. But she loved to walk. Walking was relaxing for her. She said it would calm her nerves. Uh huh. Okay. My my mother who is deceased, she loved to iron too. So when you say that, I was like, man, there there is somebody else that liked to do it as yeah. much as my mother. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So she's into music. I like the police as well. Um, but uh, so we'll move on to this. Um. When she moved out, maybe when, like you said, it got to a point maybe that, you know, maybe scared your kids a little bit. So what kind of uh, housing arrangement uh, did you make this for her? Did she get, did she arrange this herself? How did that all happen? Well, she was living with us and she and I just had a talk that, you know, there were some concerns and we felt that there might be something that would be just a better arrangement for her. And um, so I called around and she was there with me. I called around, tried to find some apartments that were close to us. But at the time we were living in Ashland City and there just wasn't a whole lot, you know, that would work for her. So I started calling to um, like Centerstone, mental health, you know, groups and things like that to see if they could help me find something that was kind of had a little more to it, you know, more of a group home type setting. And I actually found her one that was in Clarksville, Tennessee. And it was a home that was set up where I think it was like five to six women would live there and they had their own room. So it was just basically a house and they would live mm -hmm. there. And then they had a social worker case manager that would come by like once a week, just check out the home, make sure everything was okay. I had a van that would pick them up and take them to a center where they would do meet with their psychiatrist and do activities. And it was nice because she could come and go, but there was still some sort of monitoring and it sure. wasn't too far away, so I could see her as much as I wanted to. Okay, and, um, you know, of course, as we know, uh, you know, my dad's 85, but he's still uh, very physically and mentally capable. But we know how difficult you know, sometimes for adult children that can be, you know, father, mother, maybe you need to start getting uh, some help. Was this uh, something that was difficult for you with your mother, or did she kind of understand, you know what, this is what we got to do? She did. She understood. She knew, you know, the issues that she had. And she also knew she just liked to do some do some things different. She liked to kind of have her own independence and, you know, be able to be the woman of her house, yeah. so to speak. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, she did. She understood and she was at peace with it. It was fine. We, we talked most every day mm -hmm. and she would even write me letters. She would be on the phone with me and tell me she was writing me a letter and she'd mail it to me tomorrow. So... <laughs> That mm -hmm. was just something that she normally did. So okay. yeah, we had a good relationship, as good as could be. You know, yeah. it wasn't the same as like a, you know, typical mother daughter relationship, but it was good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. And and so for the timeline purposes, how long would you say that she lived in this home before she went missing? I th I think about two years. Two years. You know, it's okay. been a while, but I think it was about two years. Okay. So, and would you say in general that she liked living there for those two years? 
Sometimes she did. You know, it kind of went through cycles. You know, she liked it when she moved there. After she had lived there for a little while, she kind of had a little bit of conflict with at least one of the ladies there. She just kind of felt like they were sort of intrusive on her and kind of wanting some of the things that she had. And Mm -hmm. so just little things like that. But other than that, she did. She liked it. She liked the home. She wanted to be with me, but that that was a good alternative. Right. And we'll talk about that in a second. I guess what I'm saying is in your impression, had she not gone missing, she would have continued to live at this home and she would have been fine there. I believe so. Yes. Okay. Let's move on to this. Um, now you said you helped her move into this place. You were living in Ashton city, but at some point, cause this is kind of important to this disappearance, but you did not live in Tennessee when she went missing. You lived in Florida. Uh, maybe we just need to get into that for just a moment. How did it come to be that you're there near your mother in Tennessee, but you, your husband and your, I guess your children then moved uh, to, to Florida. How, how did that all happen? Okay, well, basically, my husband at the time, my ex-husband now, we had a vacation that was just too good of a vacation. (laughs) And so somebody offered us a timeshare. We visited Florida. Florida, We just just had a great time. And um, when we just kind of jokingly talked about moving down there when we were on vacation, and we ended up actually doing it. I think it was a month or so, a month, maybe two months later that we ended up moving. And of course the whole plan was we were going to get moved and get my mom down there mm-hmm. and get her the same type of services set up in Florida that yeah. she had in Tennessee. Okay. And this was over in Orlando. It was Kissimmee. So Kissimmee, right. right. Well, it's yeah. Kind of. Yeah. I guess that. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I know of course where that is. So it's a little uh, South west of orlando for anybody who doesn't know where that is and i've been there many times i've been to some uh to car auctions they're just watching all the classic cars they, they used to have a big show there okay so um you you were you would visit her though you were living in tennessee how did your mother feel about you moving away well she didn't want me to move away but she knew that the plan was to get her there and she was fine with living in Florida. She liked Florida too. She was completely fine. So she just wanted us to hurry up and get her there as quickly as we could. Okay. But that did, that's not the way it went though. Right. Of course she disappeared from Tennessee. She didn't disappear from Florida. Right. Just very quickly. Can you explain why uh, that didn't end up happening? Well, we, you know, with her um, mental issues and things that she had, I was trying to find her a home similar to what she had in Tennessee, and Mm -hmm. we just weren't able to find that. And I even tried finding an apartment that was close to us. That way, you know, really I could manage it, but they would be close enough for me to do that and just couldn't find anything that she could afford with the type of income that she had. You know, she was a little older at this point than she was back when she worked at McDonald's and she didn't have as much income. And so right. trying to find that, and we just, we were struggling. The the service, the, the social services weren't the same. The the homes weren't the same. And it was just really having a hard time with finding that for her. Yeah, I, uh, everybody knows that I live here in Florida and I'm familiar with that area. But of course, Kissimmee, it's kind of a touristy area in contrast to Clarksville, Tennessee. Could be a little more expensive. Uh, real estate, a little more at a premium. And, you know, I can understand how those, all those things, uh, you know, of course, uh, could be true. All right. So we'll, we'll come back to you being here uh, a little bit later. Um, but, the, but you, once again, it's not like you moved down there and said, oh, mom's going to live in Tennessee and I'm going to live in Florida. The plan was to try to get her to move down there. It just didn't work out. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, talk about this woman very quickly. She's going to come up later, but something I think we need to give the listeners a little to think about just in general for now, but who is Sue Smith? Uh, She was a lady before my mom lived with me the last time. So when she went missing, she was living in this group home before that she was with me before that she was at this place called Hadley Park Towers, which is a based on income and um, housing um, facility that's in Nashville. And she met Sue there. Sue was one of the residents that lived there, and um, my mom, she and my mom, kind of, kind of made friends. My mom would kind of talk a little bit about how she was a little pushy, and would come over and would want things from her—food, money, cigarettes, things, and stuff like that. But she still 
kept a relationship with her, but it was, you know, it was kind of on off as far as whether it was a friendship or not. Okay. And um, you kind of then knew Sue? Vaguely. I had seen her, like when I would go there to see my mom, I'd seen her several times. And so I met her that way. And I heard my mom talk about her occasionally, but that's about okay. it. But Sue did not live in this place where your mother was living when she went missing. Correct. Okay. Do you have any idea if Sue uh, would come over to see your mother at this place? Any ideas regarding that? I do not. My mom never mentioned that she went there. Now, Sue did show up at my house in Ashland City in mm -hmm. between that time. Yeah. And um, I don't know how far you want to go into we'll that. We'll get into that a little bit later, but we're just concerned about maybe near the disappearance. I, I guess what I'm saying is Sue Smith lived at least close enough that she could have gone to see your mother in Clarksville she wanted. Correct. Okay. All right. So this is a woman. And how long would you say that your mother and Sue knew each other? At least maybe five years. Okay. And she was around your mother's age? I think so. Pretty close within mm -hmm. a few years, one way or the other. Yeah. Okay. Uh, of course, we've talked about your mother's mental health, but I think that, you know, talking about her disappearance, we also must be concerned with her physical health. And I understand uh, that she had uh, COPD. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Once again, in the healthcare field, you know about this. Maybe you can give a, an assessment of how bad this was. We know that this can get so bad that people, of course, can die from it. But uh, what was at what stage was your mother at that time? And did she have any other physical issues, if you feel comfortable talking about them? Okay. Yeah, well, she when she lived with me, she, apparently she had had COPD for a while. So I don't know exactly when she was diagnosed with it. And But she, she smoked and she just continued on with life as normal. And when she was living with me that last time, I did notice she was coughing a lot more. She was struggling a lot more with it. And then when she ended up moving into the group home at some point there, she ended up going on intermittent oxygen. So she was able to do a lot of things. Like I would pick her up, go pay bills, take her to do her shop and take her out to eat and take her back. And she was fine. Mm -hmm. But of course that, you know, that amount of time got shorter and shorter. Right. But and so she was deteriorating in that. Okay. And, uh, but she did have an oxygen tank. She did not when she lived with me and not when she first moved into the group home, but she okay. got it after she was living there. Yes. Okay. And she had the oxygen tank, but she was still smoking. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. That's can be a recipe for disaster as we oxygen and then, and fire put close to each other. That, um, um, of course she's missing, but I, maybe we should just be happy that there was an, ex an explosion or something at that group home. We know that can be very, very dangerous. And we know this is very common. I mean, all, you and I both, we know that a lot of people do that. They have lung issues and they just will not stop smoking. They're going to continue to smoke and, you know, what are you going to do about it? Um, but regarding her walking though, without oxygen, how, in your opinion, how far could she go before it might get dangerous? As far as if she was like walking outside to go somewhere, I mean, I, not very long. Cause you know, when I took her somewhere, it's not like we walked around the mall all day, you know, we would be in and out of the car and she would spend most of the time sitting. So not very long at all. I, I would think if she's out walking, probably 30 minutes, it's kind of the first okay, thing not comes long, to mind. Not long. And then she'd have to get on our oxygen again. Mm-hmm. Okay. When, and we're going to talk about, you know, the day that she disappeared. Is this one of these oxygen tanks like she could carry with her? It was like in a cart or was this something that she could only use at home? The last one I saw, because like I said, when I moved to Florida, you know, as far as if she got something during that time, not that I remember, but when the last that I knew, it was just a tank that you roll around in the house. So it was definitely not something she could have taken with her. All right, she, uh, this walk that we're going to be talking about, this is not something that she probably would have taken with her. Correct. Okay. All right. So you're in Florida. She has these, um, you know, physical issue with the COPD. Um, and in your impression in the, maybe the weeks before she went missing, how was she managing her medication? She seemed to be doing pretty good for a while. When I first went to Florida, I was concerned about that. She was, you know, kind of 
talking a little different. You know, I was sort of noticing some things, but I know she was upset because she knew it was going to be a little bit before I got her there. And then she seemed to do okay for a while, but there towards the end, I did notice that she was, she was kind of starting with just her way of talking that was a little different. Okay. And did you like ask her, mom, are you taking your medication or anything like that? I did. And she told me that she was. I said, are you sure, mom? I said, it uh -huh. sounds like, you know, it kind of sounds like maybe you're missing uh -huh. something. Are you taking them all? And yeah. she said she was. She just, she just missed me. Okay. And uh, of course, she never did end up moving to Florida for already the reasons you explained. How did she handle that when you, you were like, you know, mom, there's just, there's just not the same. It's just not the same down here in Florida. How did she react to that? Well, she wanted to just go ahead and move into the house with me. That's what she was saying. She said, well, I'll just come down there and I'll just go ahead and live with you until we find something. Mm -hmm. um, that's what she was wanting to do. Okay. But that wasn't going to happen, right? Correct. Okay. But it, you should know, the, the listeners should know, though, at the time of her disappearance, you were actually planning on moving back to Tennessee. Yes. Right? Yes, was it because of your mother or because of something else? For me, it was mainly because of my mom. Oh, mom. You know, okay. we were having some issues with the, our daughter that was in, that's in the wheelchair services. You know, we were having a hard time with that, but that's something I would have dealt with. But that, in addition to not being able to get my mom there, I just, that was the whole plan was to get yeah. her there. I would not have moved without that. And so knowing that I couldn't do that and I couldn't get, let her move in with me, my, my ex-husband wasn't okay with that. So he wasn't going to allow that. And so then for me, the only other option was to move back. And for my ex, for him, he didn't like working in Florida. So okay. he wanted to go back to Tennessee. So just kind of all of those sort of came together. Okay. So this move to Florida just didn't plan, come out the way you wanted. Yeah. Just a lot of moving parts that could not be put together. Correct. Okay. All right. Let's move up um, to that day uh, of her disappearance. And uh, anything now in retrospect, looking back at it in those days, maybe that month of March of 2004, once you already talked about how maybe, you know, she said she was taking her medication. I'm not so sure, but maybe just those couple weeks before she went missing, missing anything that maybe in retrospect that now you think about, man, that doesn't seem right now. Maybe I didn't, I didn't recognize it at the time, but now thinking back now, unfortunately, 18 years, man, I should have recognized something. Anything like that that strikes you now, maybe that you didn't notice at the time. You know, there've been different things that came up and that over time I've thought differently about, you know, when she was wanting to move to Florida and I told her, you know, that she couldn't live with us and we couldn't find anything. So we were going to move back. And she had said, well, you don't need to come back to Tennessee. There's nothing here for you. I'll just move down there and I'll just live with you. And I said, well, mama, like I told you, you're not going to be able to live with us. And she said, well, I'll just move on the beach then. I'll just live on the beach until you find something. And I said, Mama, you, with your sickness, you can't do that. Uh -huh. I said, but it's okay. I said, we want to come back anyway. And I said, the house is already on the market. We're told it's probably going to sell fast. I said, we're going to be back. And then closer to when she went missing, when I had talked to her, and I told her, I said, the house already sold. I, she said, you don't have to come back. And I said, Mama, I said, we, are, we already sold the house. It's already sold. I said, so we'll be there in two weeks. And so before, and then in those two weeks is when she went missing. Correct. Yes. Okay. Well, you know, I should know I'm living here in Florida. There are people who live on the beach. They just don't happen to be uh, your mother's age. Of course, we do have people, you know, young people who live on the beach down here, but yes, maybe that would have been a little tough. Um, so let's move up to, uh, excuse me. <laughs> with her own oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. With her own the oxygen. Certainly. Okay. Let's move up to that day, March 20th, 2004. And I guess maybe the most important part of this, besides her disappearing this day, is that you actually spoke to her that day. Why don't you tell listeners about that? I did. It was um, the day after my son's birthday, and we were taking him to Gatorland in Orlando. So that was something that we had planned and we nice. were doing. And I talked to her on the phone, and we talked about that. And that's when I told her, the house sold, we'll be there in two weeks. And so I told her what we were going to do for my son's birthday, that we were going to be back in two weeks. We chatted for a little while. Everything was fine. I was excited telling her we were coming home and our house in Tennessee hadn't sold. So we were just going to move right back into it. 
Wow. And um, so I'd still be the same distance from her. And um, so we were excited about that. And then she told me she was going to later ask her what she was going to do that day. And she said she was going to walk to the market and get her some cigarettes. Okay. And you're on, once again, we talked about her physical abilities. Uh, knowing her the way you did, did that alarm you? She said she was going to, and once uh, I'm going to be doing a map analysis video to show everybody where this location was, but was that something that you thought was reasonable? Knowing her the way you did and her condition that she could walk to the store and back and, um, you know, it wasn't a risk. I didn't like it. I was uncomfortable with it, but I knew she had, you know, I couldn't control it. And that was, you know, she's a grown woman, made her own decisions and she did it regularly. And so my understanding, she was going to go to the market. She was going to get cigarettes. She was going to come right back home. Okay. And so in that short of amount of time, like I said, I didn't like it, but I mm -hmm. knew she had done it before and she could do it. Right. You know, if she had any, being that there were other uh, people in this home, did they ever like uh, go together or maybe somebody had a car? Did she ever go with somebody else? Maybe somebody who made a, she made friends with, uh, or is this always something that she'd been by herself? From my understanding, it was always by herself. She never told me she went with anyone else. She wasn't close with anyone else in the house. And um, I don't think she just, she didn't trust them, really. She didn't feel good with them. Okay. And so, and like I said, she liked to walk. She uh -huh. she couldn't drive. She, ne she never drove, so. Okay. And this phone call, this was on some sort of landline. This was not a cell phone. Did she have a cell phone? No. No cell phone. All right. So you're thinking she's going to uh, go down to this market. She's going to be right back. And do you remember like maybe the rest of the day? Were you expecting for her to call you later? Were you expecting to talk to her the next day? What were your expectations as to when you would speak to her next? I figured I would probably talk to her the next day. Sometimes we would talk more than once a day, but not usually. And it wasn't every day. It was most every day, but occasionally we would miss a day. And so I just figured I'd hear from her the next day and... I'd tell her how Gatorland was mm -hmm. and that we were Gatorland. packing. Okay. All right. So, of course, we know this is the last time uh, that you spoke to her. And I'll ask you again, how did she sound on the phone? Did she sound like on medication, off medication? She sounded pretty stable that day. It was actually the few a few phone calls before. But I think that day she was excited about us coming back. And that, like, lifted her spirit. She felt better about it that day. And she okay. was excited about it, you know, us going to Gatorland. And so, okay. and I told her, I said, we'll be home. She loved to go to Chinese foods. So I said, we'll be home. I'm going to take you out to Chinese. Wow. I think I would have liked your mother a lot. She's into the police <laughs> and like Chinese, likes Chinese food, <laughs> Connie. Boy, uh, she, I, I feel like I know her already. Okay. Um, so the next day, of course, rolls around. And of course, you do not hear from her. Do you try to call her? Um, do you maybe, is there like a, like a general phone line to the home or somebody you could call what happens that next day, or maybe within the next few days that you start thinking maybe something's not right or what goes on those next few days? I really didn't because no more time had passed than what it would normally be for us to talk. And so my first awareness of it is I got a call and I, I can't remember, I, I can't remember if it was the detective or the news station first. Huh. that called me and that's how i found out they said that she didn't come home see so you, so you, once again it wasn't like you called somebody looking for her. somebody else knew about her being missing first and then told you yeah huh do you remember was that uh, the 21st the 22nd the 23rd do you remember what day that was i think it was the 21st so the very next day it, it was either the 21st or the 22nd okay, so i know so... it had it hadn't been two full days since i had talked to her Okay. And uh, I realized that that'd be a very traumatic call for you, but what you can remember about it, how did that all get started? Who initially started the chain of events that eventually ended up to somebody calling you? Was it somebody at the home that recognized she wasn't there or, or what? How did that all get, happen? From my understanding, that's what it was, is somebody at the home reported that she didn't come home. Cause like I said, they were allowed to come and go, but mm -hmm. you know, with several people being in the home, they would notice if she normally came home and she didn't. Wow. And so I think that was reported to like the landlord, the case manager that kind of oversaw the house. And then that's when it was reported to the police mm -hmm. and they called me to let me know. Okay. And immediately 
what were you thinking? That What was your knee-jerk reaction as to, of course, you're hoping that this is just a misunderstanding. Maybe she's in the hospital somewhere or something like that. Uh, but what was your, what was your knee-jerk reaction when they told you that? Well, I mean, at first, you know, there was a fear mm -hmm. that, you know, I felt. But then after that kind of initial fear, I thought, well, you know, years ago, she had wandered off. And she turned up in a mental institution. You know, she had been picked up. She had gone off of her meds. And so but it had been years since that had happened. And I thought, well, maybe that's what it is. Maybe, you know, maybe she got, you know, wandered off. Or maybe, you know, she, yeah. she went somewhere with somebody. And yeah. so I was alarmed, but not hugely alarmed at that point. Because like I said, it really it hadn't been two full days. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just... Mm -hmm. I just expected her to show up, really. Sure. I really expected her to show up with someone or in the hospital. So okay. I was alarmed, but I wasn't in a, at a panic at that point yet. All right. So just to be clear about this, she had walked off uh, before, but it wasn't recently. You see, I think maybe I had in my notes that it was like 20 years before this or something. Yeah, it had, it had been a really, really long time when I was younger and, and she had done that. She had gone off of her meds and she was picked up and went into an institution and that's, you know, how she was found or. Okay. And I think she had done it a time or two where she had found, found a man and she wandered off that way and she kind of came back around, but that was okay. when I was young. That okay. Was was All young. right. Okay. All right. So they call you to tell you this. You're thinking immediately back to like 20 years before, hoping that's exactly what happened. And did anybody at that point try to call? I really don't know. Clarksville, do they have a, a mental hospital there? What would be maybe a, a bigger city? Did anybody bother to try to call any of these places to see if a Mary Cox had been admitted? What Was this done or not? The detective said he was taking care of all of that. Of course, I tried from Florida. And no one would tell me anything because of HIPAA. Right. You know, they told me if she was right there, they wouldn't be able to tell me anything. So the detective said that he was taking care of all of that. And he would let me know if she turned up. And I was telling him, you know, all the places that she could possibly be. Telling him everyone that I knew that she knew. And he was following up on all of that. And... Okay. Now, listeners need to understand that despite you finding out that your mother is missing, you did not or could not immediately return to Tennessee, right? Correct. Correct. Uh, I, I wanted to. <laughs> I know you, I, I know you did. Um, but when did you finally get back to Tennessee? How many days later? It was about two weeks later. It was, and that was actually wow. the day that we were loading the truck when her purse was found. Okay, well, we will get, I certainly want to get into that uh, a little later. So it took you two weeks. Your understanding, I realize you were not there, but in those two weeks, while you're trying to get back to Tennessee, and listeners should understand that you wanted to, but there were things that were in the way, um, what was done? Were any searches done? Did anybody, did the police like go? If you told them, we well, you know she told me she was going to this store. Did anybody look into any of this, you know, video cameras and things like that? What is your understanding of what went on in those two weeks, being that you weren't there? The detective was telling me they were doing everything that they could do. He went to the market. Um, people had at the market had said she had shown up. And so okay. that, that they had seen her there, but they didn't know anything. And he checked with the hospitals. He checked, like I gave him her friends' names and phone numbers and ex-boyfriend's name and phone number, where she used to live, where Sue lived. I gave him Sue's information. And he followed up on all of those. And he was just saying everything was coming back and there, he didn't have any suspicion that there was anything else going on. Okay. Now, like uh, I've already said, I'm going to be doing a map analysis video, but I have never been there. How would you explain this area, uh, where she lived? How would you explain the walk that she would be taking? Is this like a neighborhood area, a woodsy area? Is it a safe area, being that you've been there many, many times? How would you explain this area? It, it was a neighborhood, you know, just lots of little single family homes. And she'd kind of go around a loop and down and down a road that went out the main road through her subdivision. And then that took her right onto the main road where the market was. So it wasn't far. Okay. So um, safe area? 
we just uh, as safe can be. Of course, we always know there are people, crazy people driving around in cars all the time. But just in general, neighborhood, okay? Yeah, in general, you know, there was a few things kind of between where the market was and her house was that was a little uncomfortable. But right where her house was, it was fine. Okay. Any big, uh, it, once again, in those few weeks, any big searches organized for the area? The detective said that they went out, that they, they looked for everything. It was actually later that um, I got back in touch with them and asked them to go into the river. And so that was something that happened later. But at the time, I thought that that was part of the search. Yeah. But it wasn't. It wasn't. Okay. Right. And we're going to get to the, uh, we'll get to the uh, river when we talk about her purse. All right. So it takes you two weeks to get back. Uh, you moved back into the home that you had lived in before that, that you still followed that plan. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. So you eventually get back there and already, once again, it's already been two weeks. They're calling people and, and all of that. So let's um, move on to this that day. Did anybody, of course, we know what the store people said, but my experience also is that sometimes people can't keep their day straight, especially if she was going in there every few days. They might have thought there she was in there on March 20th, but it might have been March 18th or March 17th at all. You know, a lot of, mm -hmm. it's a lot, there's a lot more wiggle room in there than the public realizes. But did anybody who is believable see her walking being that it's a neighborhood, being that there's houses and, and everything, anybody actually see her walking that day that is believable? Not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. So the police never said, you know, we talked to this person down the street, a half block down the street and said, oh yeah, uh, I did see her walking by my house that day. Not that I'm aware of. No. no. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have the store owner who says, or store clerk or whoever, who says, yeah, she was, she actually did make it to the store on March 20th. On the other hand, there's really nobody who can say that, uh, any, you know, anybody that she would have passed the house could say that. Would you say that an, uh, a woman of your mother's age would uh, stick out walking on, on the road there? Or would you say that's somewhat, that's something common? Now, when we would go like from that main road where the market was to her house, I would see a lot of people out walking and doing things. So I don't think it, she, it would have stood out. Okay. But on the other hand, then if there's other people walking. You think somebody would have seen her, right? Right. right. You're right. So it's kind of a paradox there. So that'll have mm -hmm. to be something that the listeners think about. And, and you know, it's so it, eyewitnesses, they're so unpredictable. It's, it's really hard to, to make any sort of rule regarding any of it. Okay. Being that it was two weeks that it took, it took you to get back to Tennessee, uh, when you went in to the place where she was staying, what can you say about getting her stuff back? Was anything missing? Anything look rearranged? Anything odd? Uh, maybe the thing that sticks out to me the most is that this oxygen tank that we talked about was not there. Is that right? Not that I saw. Now, if it had, I don't know if it was somewhere else in the house. And that didn't, you know, it had been a little bit of time. And I know medical supply companies rotate those things out. And so that wasn't really even something that I thought a whole lot about because, huh. you know, I know they would pick that up. I didn't see it, but it could have been somewhere in the house. I'm really not sure. Um, when I got there and I went to her room, because the, the manager of the home had told me at that point that I could come because I guess there was a period of time where I couldn't. And, um, but when I was finally able to go and get her belongings, I noticed that she just didn't have as much stuff as she did when I left. And, um, and yeah, just some of her things were missing. And one of the roommates in the house, cause I said something about it. And one of the roommates in the house said that she had gotten rid of some of her clothes, which didn't make sense to me, but and my mom loved clothes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How um, percentage wise, how much would you say was missing? From when the last time I saw them before I left to that yeah. day, I'd say probably about half. Wow. 50%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, shoe... noticeable right off the yeah. bat. Okay. Shoes too. Yeah, I would say so. Wow. Okay. So clothes missing, some shoes missing. Anything that you would say, maybe something that's uh, valuable or a memento or like a photo album, 
anything like that missing? Uh, any, like I said, anything valuable, anything like that, that really stuck out to you? Um, she really didn't have anything monetarily valuable, but, um, one thing that did stick out that was missing is my letters, my letters that I had sent to her. I did, they mm. weren't there and I wrote huh. her a lot. And she yeah. had saved them because she had, she had had letters from when I was a little girl. Do you know where she would keep them? Uh, like I said, it's this house. I don't know how much privacy they would have there, but do you know where she would keep them? No, no, no. And actually when I went back to get her belonging, she was in a different room than she oh, was she'd when, been moved. when I had moved. Yeah. Okay. And so, but yeah, those, those were gone and there was no explanation to that. Okay. So don't know, not sure about that. I think what you're saying about the oxygen tank makes sense. You're in the healthcare industry. I am not, you probably more understand that better. Maybe that uh, makes a lot of sense, but clothes miss missing, some shoes missing. Person in there says she gave the stuff away. You seem a little doubtful about that, but they are her clothes. Maybe that's what she did. It's certainly possible, I guess. Right. Maybe I never saw my mom give clothes away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. My first suspicion, because they just kind of acted sort of strange when I asked them about it. My first suspicion was that they had taken them and didn't want to tell me. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to talk about something later that might lead us to believe that some of the stuff was, let's just call it stolen. I mean, even if the person goes missing, it's still that person's stuff. Now, if you showed up and wanted to give her clothes to these other people, you know, that's up to you. But uh, if they're taking stuff, they don't have permission. That's stealing. Uh, what about her medication? Was it there? Did it look like she had been taking it? Were any bottles empty? Uh, your experience in this area, what did it tell you? Well, and at the time, I wasn't a nurse. I actually didn't become a nurse until oh. later in my 40s. But okay. um, I don't remember, honestly. I wish I did, but I just don't really remember about the medications. If they were, you know, if there was extra there, I, I don't remember. Okay. Uh, am I then to believe that maybe you didn't collect those things or they, uh, you, uh, you went in there and even though half her clothes were, weren't there, but you still got the other half and other things, are you saying you don't really remember getting her medication or are you just saying, you know what, it might not have been there? I, I really don't remember. Okay. I, I really don't. I wish, I wish I did. And I just think it was so much trauma from at the time yeah. and just what was happening that day. Right. And the main things that mattered to me was that I had her purse and that I had her Bible. The rest, there was nothing else that was really valuable. And so I didn't even think about her meds, really. Okay. I, I can just look, you know, think about, once again, my experience. My father's 85. Like I said, he's pretty physical, really, really good physical and mental health. But, of course, he does take a lot of pills. He's 85. And, I, of course, I would think if he went missing, I would surely, if I went up there to Pennsylvania where he lives and walked in and couldn't find any of his medication, I'd be like, well, what the heck was going on here? Because he does, you know, take quite a bit. And he puts him in those little things for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that stuff. So that, uh, My that's mom some... didn't do that. She, nope. she had like three <laughs> pill bottles. Okay. And... <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, my dad's a little, a uh, little obsessive compulsive. So, uh, yeah, that's why he does those things. All right. So we're not sure about her medication. Might have been there, might have not been there. Uh, regarding everybody else in that home and maybe the manager or the, the social worker, whoever took care of the place, even somebody maybe when it came in and cleaned, anybody in that building helpful at all? Not really. No. Any you know, insights kinda, at all? It was kind of awkward. It was like... No, I just felt like no one was interested. It was, yeah. But somebody did call it in, though, yeah. right? Somebody noticed that she was missing. Somebody who had to have had some interaction in there under that roof. But none of them could offer an opinion for it. It's just an example. Well, yeah, I remember she was going to go walking to the store, but then somebody came by and then volunteered to drive her. Nothing, no stories like that at all. Mm -mm. No. Nothing. Okay. No names of it or anybody who might have come to see her in those days before she went missing. Nothing like that. No. So no. when you say nothing, it's nothing. Zero. Yeah. Yeah. It okay. just really was. It was very just awkward and quiet. Okay. All right. So no help there. 
Uh, moving on. You talked about the purse. This is uh, something that is a, certainly a little bit of a stumper, might lead people in a particular direction. We're just going to cover it factually. You had said that on the very day, of course, two weeks after your mother went missing, the very day that you were, I guess, pulling back into Tennessee, her purse appears. Uh, was it on the banks of the river or was it in the river? Why don't you tell um, the listeners and viewers about her purse being found? Okay. And I actually got the call while we were in Florida. We were loading up the okay. truck. So it was like the U-Haul was sitting right outside the house. We were loading it and I got a call and I believe it was from the detective. And there was a man fishing on the bank and at the mm -hmm. river in Clarksville. And he saw it floating near the bank. And huh. he pulled it in and turned it in. Okay. And the way they identified it was as your mother's purse, I guess maybe a wallet or something with her. Mm -hmm. She did, you said she didn't drive, but some sort of ID was in there, a credit card or ATM card or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She had a debit card in there and she had a, it's a state ID. So it looks like a driver's license, but. Okay. And this was two weeks after you spoke to her and she said she was going to the market. Correct. All right, so this was into April now of 2004. Um, can you um, say the, you know, the approximate or exact location of where this fisherman was? What is your understanding of where this point, where, where this spot is? It was about 10 miles from where she lived. It was in the hilltop area. And so it was past, quite a bit past where the market was. Mm -hmm. And it was in the river. Yes. And, and so I guess what we're saying here for the listeners and viewers is that you would think, let's just say, I'm not saying I believe this, but to think about this, just to explain it, if she did end up near the river and went the, if the purse and she, let's just say, went into the river, the purse should have been surely much more downstream two weeks later than where it was found, correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, so we have to think about that. Um, did you get this through, uh, when you finally did make it to Tennessee, did they show you the purse? Anything odd about it? Anything missing in it? Uh, of course, it would have been wet, but cigarettes in it? Anything that, that strikes you as being odd about it? There was no cash in there. From my, from my perspective, from what I could tell, everything was there that I knew my mom would have had in her purse. But there was no cash in the purse, but everything else was there. Um, it didn't look destroyed. It didn't, you know, it didn't look like what I would have thought a purse would have looked like if it had been in there for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And it was actually quite a bit later. I didn't get it immediately. Okay. It was months, months later before the detective actually turned it over to me. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So would you say it was still in 2004 that that happened? Maybe. It might have been 2005. Wow. I could, look, okay. I could look back on my timeline. All right. Just so we know, just uh, an idea. So you're not, you know, so it wasn't just a few months down the road. It might have been fully into the next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It was a while. I had to ask him about it because I was like, it's the last thing I knew she had with her. Okay. I want to see what's in there. I want to go through it and see if there's right. anything that could lead me to something. Sure. Of course. Uh, what kind of purse was this? Was it leather? Was it cloth? Was it pleather? Uh, maybe explain this ple uh, le uh, purse to the listeners. Just a fake leather, nothing fancy, you know, mm -hmm. something that would not weather well in river wa water. Oh, goodness. goodness. No, no not okay. at all. Mm -hmm. But you said in your opinion that it just didn't look like it had been in the water for two weeks. Right. Yeah. I mean, it just didn't look like it had that, what you would consider that type of weather damage, even though it was a while before I got it. So it had time to dry out. Yeah. It still would have seemed like it would have broken down. It would have, you know, there'd have been some water damage and I just okay. didn't see that on it. Okay. Um, did the police or investigator since 2004, the last 18 years, have they ever given you an opinion on whether they thought that the purse was actually in the river for two weeks or of course the alternative is that somebody just threw the purse in there maybe that day have they ever given their opinion on that not at all none okay um any suspicion regarding this fisherman or just or just right place right time good samaritan 
that's basically what was my understanding of it. That's the way it was presented to me. Okay. And I didn't suspect anything else. So, I mean, he turned it in and so. Okay. And so we have to remember this is the exact day that you were still in Florida, but that was the day you were pulling out. Mm -hmm. to, and, the, and that was when that was found. Okay. Did that, uh, when the purse was found, did it reignite any searches in that area? where the purse was found, anything like that. And maybe we should talk about river searches now. Uh, what kind of river searches were done? Of course, you know, two weeks later, of course you'd think the purse would be long gone if it went into the water, but it wasn't. So uh, what kind of work was done in the river eventually? Well, none originally. It was after I had spoken with somebody else that works with missing persons. <laughs> And they mm -hmm. gave me a list of questions and they said, do you know? And I'm like, I, I don't know. No one's telling me anything. And so this lady gave me a list of questions of things to ask them. And that's what I asked them. I said, did y'all go in the river? Did you go in with dogs? Did you, you know? And so I just kind of went through that with them and they did say that they went back in. Okay. All right. Uh, but it, it, once again, uh, she goes missing on March 20th. The purse isn't uh, found until April, but you'd think if it was in the water, it'd be long gone. So it's worth it to go in there and see if she is around the area. Of course, she is not found. It's a little hard to understand, though, still. A uh, purse pops up after two weeks in a river. All right. So, uh, but everything seemed to be in there except the money that your mother would usually carry. Yeah, the cash. Okay. Usually... <laughs> she was kind of funny. She'd get her check at the beginning of the month and she'd spend it all. So she would always ask me about the middle of the month to send her about $50 in cash so that she'd uh -huh. be able to get through the rest of the month. Uh huh. Okay. And so I had just done that. I had mm -hmm. just sent that. And I believe that's what she was going to the market with that day, was with that. All cash. right. So you would maybe expect $50 to be in that purse or, or at least the change from whatever she used to buy, buy cigarettes that day. Yes. Okay. But none of that was in there. All right. But that was not the only thing of hers uh, that was eventually found. Uh, of course, that was two weeks later, but we're going to talk about something that was much, much, much later. And that is this Kroger card. Uh, we have to remember, this was not like some sort of credit card or a debit card for Kroger. This is like, like you use it and you get discounts, something like that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Please explain what happened with that. I got a letter. It's like I said, when we moved from Florida back to Tennessee, we moved back into the same house that we had lived in. And that was the house that she lived in with us. And I got a letter saying basically, thank you for shopping with us. Huh. Yeah. And it was on uh, May 30th of 2005. Over a year later. That was dated. Yes. And in her purse, when her purse was found, there were not, her keys were not there. Oh, so her keys are, are keys still missing? As far as I know, yes. Wow. Okay. So sticking on this card, we'll get, maybe come back to the keys for a moment. But this Kroger card, this is something your opinion would usually be in her purse? Yes. Okay. It and so key, it should have been on her keychain. It's one of those that oh, okay. on to the keychain. Okay. So that's, and then the keys are missing. I see you draw uh, that connection now. Okay. Um, had you ever received uh, one of these letters? Uh, we have to maybe figure this out. Why would, it's her card. Why would you get a letter? Because she lived with me so that, because when you sign up for the cards, you put in your address. So my address was the address they had on file. Okay, so when she got this so card, how many? Name, but my address. Okay, so whenever she got this card years before, it is one of those times when you two were living together. Yes. Okay. Had you ever gotten a letter in the past at all? Now I realize you moved to Florida for a little while, but is that the only letter you ever received from Kroger regarding the use of that card? I think so. I don't think I ever had another one. Huh. Any I'm insight good. into that? I'm not familiar with these kind of reward programs. I know my dad has a sheets card up in Pennsylvania. I'm not familiar with this. What is your understanding of it? I mean, you know, it just kind of works like a coupon, you know, is kind of mm -hmm. how it works. But I just thought it was weird. It, it was weird that I got the letter. Yeah. It was weird that it was a year later. Mm -hmm. And when I mentioned it to the detective, it, it took a 
significant amount of time before he was able to follow up on it. And by the time he followed up on it, they said there would be no records as far as cameras or recordings, anything like that. And so all they could, all they could tell me was that it was for $4 and 32 cents that was spent and that it was at the Dover crossing road Kroger. So surely they don't send out letters every time a card's used. Surely mm -hmm. they don't do that. So the way you, do you have, still have that letter? I do. And what exactly was the tone of the letter? Just thanking somebody for using the card? That was it? Yeah, it was. And I had a Kroger Plus card. I never got a letter for it. Hmm. Have you ever been able to figure out, have you ever gone to a Kroger and asked somebody, what would come out to be $4.32? I guess it could be a combination of things, which would make things very tough. But, you know, and I know cigarettes have gotten very expensive, but would $4.32 been enough to buy a pack of cigarettes in 2004 or 2005? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to look that up. Uh, but has anybody ever, uh, have you ever tried that? Gone to a, Kro you know, went to a Kroger at the time and asked them, you know, I got this. Any idea what would be $4.32 in this store? No, because that wasn't really something that was a concern to me. I just, mm -hmm. my thought was somebody has her keys. Okay. Or at least somebody at some point had her keys. Right. Okay. So we have this, somebody used their card sometime uh, for something. And we have to remember that half her clothes were missing, half her shoes were missing. And so we might be open to the idea that maybe one of those people took that card, but like you said, it's also with their keys. Um, originally, when you found out that she was missing, make it back to uh, Tennessee, uh, I guess you quickly realized her keys were missing? It Well, I really didn't, not right off the bat, because huh. the detective had the purse. It was a while before I got the purse. Oh, okay. And so they weren't there and they weren't in any of her things. Okay. And on this key ring, what keys, of course, we know the Kroger, uh, and we have to realize that maybe for the listeners and viewers who don't understand this, when you say that this uh, Kroger card was attached to a key ring, it's not like it was a full, like a full size credit card. It's like, like mm -hmm. this tiny strip, right? Correct. It, yes. It's a really tiny strip made of durable plastic. It's not going to rip off or anything like that. Right. All right, so it's a little tiny strip that you can just put on your key ring. It's not a full-size credit card that we might use uh, at the ATM or something. Um, what would have, what keys would have been on that ring? Or And there, are there any other discount types of things that she would have had? Not that I can think of. The only one I know that she had was the Kroger Plus card, and the only key that she would have was the key to her house. Hmm. All right. And I'm guessing that once she went missing and the keys were never found, they didn't go and change any of the locks at this home where she was living, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. Because usually that's what happens when you lose keys and people are living in a place, usually the locks get changed, but to your knowledge, they didn't do that. Right. And they may have, and I just might not be aware of it, but sure. not that I know of. Okay. So we got this Kroger card. We got this purse. Uh, two weeks later, we got a Kroger card over a year later uh, for a very small uh, amount of money. Not sure what to make of that. Let's move on to this. We talked about her very early in this conversation. We're going to revisit her again. And this is Sue Smith. What I first want to talk about is you had kind of, um, you know, mentioned that you had had a problem with Sue at one point, but this I think was well before your mother went missing. Why don't you talk about that? She tried to get into your house and you wouldn't let her. Why don't you tell the listeners about that? Yeah, she showed up one day, and to my recollection, recollection, my mom wasn't there because actually my stepdad that my mom had been married to years ago was there, and I think he was the only person that was there that day. So my mom, I think this was at the point where she had already moved, and the lady showed up at the door, and I didn't know she was coming, and when I opened the door and she was there, and she was saying she wanted to see my mom, and I, well, I remember, I remember telling her she doesn't live here anymore. And mm -hmm. she was, she accused me of lying to her. And I said, no, she, she was aggressive. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I said, she doesn't live here anymore and you need to leave. And she tried to force her way into the house. So I had to push, I had to push her out and she was resisting me. I had to push her out and force wow. the door shut and lock it and call the police. And she, she wouldn't leave. She stayed in the driveway. The police actually had to make her leave. 
what was the motivation uh, for her? Was she just crazed or did she think that you were intentionally keeping your mother from her the way you look at it now? Or was she just acting, you know, was she having some sort of mental episode? How do you look at it now? Well, I mean, I think she, she was attached to my mom. She had feelings for my mom. Um, she, and my mom did not return those feelings. She, like I said, she used my mom, you know, for material things, financial things. And I never saw her when my mom was living there. So they weren't, you know, there wasn't really anything as far as that. But I think, I think part of it was, you know, she was having an episode herself. Mm -hmm. She was wanting something from my mom. She wasn't wanting to believe that my mom wasn't there. And she was, she came there to get something that day. But this would have been a few, this is before you even moved to Florida. So this could have been what, 2001, 2000, somewhere. Yeah, let's see. Cause I got Mandy. It was after, I believe I had adopted Mandy. So yeah, maybe 2002, okay. 2003, somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay. And but she was, she was just aggressive and, but it was just, it was strange to me because I didn't even know she knew where I lived. So huh. my mom had communicated that at some point that that's where we were. Okay. Did uh, Sue ever apologize for this? No, I didn't have any more communication with her. Okay. You, uh, are you saying that was the last interaction you ever had with her? I believe so. I don't think that I've, I don't think that I ever talked to her. The detective said he did, but I did. I don't think that I ever did after that. Okay. Um, did, did the detective talk to her because you recommended it? Yes. All right. So he, like, for example, he asked you, you know, is there anybody I should talk to? And, mm -hmm. uh, you, Sue Smith's name came to mind. Yes. Yes. I told okay. him all the friends that I knew their names and phone numbers and her ex-boyfriend. I gave him everything I knew. Mm -hmm. Did he ever get back to you with any of that? Did he ever say, I talked to Sue Smith and... She was very cooperative in his opinion. He was very, she was very co cooperative. Any feedback like that? He did let me know that he did talk to the people at Hadley Park Towers, her and then her ex-boy, my mom's ex-boyfriend and some other people. And he didn't suspect anything. Mm -hmm. okay. He said just basically everything was coming up dead ends. Okay. Other than your mother simply telling Sue Smith, you know, I'm going to be walking down to the market that day. Is there any way that Sue would have known that, you know, for example, could she have been like being that she, as you stated, um, would take things from your mother. Your mother would give her things. She demanded things. She was very needy, maybe even ripping your mother off. Let's say, uh, would she have been the type of person to kind of just hang out waiting for your mother to come out or, uh, do we want to go that far with it or what do you think about that? Well, I could definitely see if I see, I, I could definitely see her doing that. Yes. Whether she would have known that my mom was going to do that that day or not. I don't know. I mean, you know, like I said, my mom was lonely when I left. So it is possible that my mom was talking to her. She didn't mention that to me. She, she knew how I felt about her. She didn't mention it to me, but I could definitely see her doing that. Okay. Especially if she knew that my mom had fifty dollars in cash, even for fifty bucks. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, how far did Sue Smith live from where your mother lived? She was in Nashville, and my mom was in Clarksville. So I mean, probably, gosh, um, forty-five minutes. Something. Okay, so not far, not not close, somewhere in between. Yeah. Okay. And we have no idea whether the two were in contact at all. Right. Not that I'm aware. Like I said, she didn't tell me that she was, and I felt like she told me everything, but okay. I don't know that for sure. Okay. Um, regarding where she was staying, when you would call her, did every person there have a specific number or did you just try to call like a group number or there was like an operator or something. How would you reach your mother when you would call her? It was just one phone number and everybody shared it. And so I just call and ask for. Okay. So, and do you know if uh, the police ever checked that number to see uh, any identify any numbers or any calls that your mother would have made? 
you know if they ever did that see who she might have been in contact with i'm trying to remember i don't remember if they did that or not they may have Sorry, this is between 18 years ago. Hey, I get you. The, I, I get it. And then. I'm uh, trying to remember. I, I totally but, understand. Um, These are just the questions I have to ask, but just nothing. Uh, I guess what you're saying is nothing really comes to mind. Mm -hmm. You know, if there would have been something that they did, checking phone numbers, they might have done it and not told you. That's always possible. Mm -hmm. But if right. they told you, you'd surely remember. Right. And I would have noted it, and it's not in my notes. Yeah. Okay. So move on to this and I just, we're going to just touch upon this very lightly because I'm going to, I, uh, I'm guessing the listeners are going to wonder, well, why did it take you two weeks? Your mother's missing. Why did it take you two weeks to get back to Tennessee? I'm going to give you an opportunity to say whatever you want about that right now. Why did it take you two weeks to get back to Tennessee? I initially just wanted to just hop in the car and go. And um, because we were in the process of moving, my my husband at the time, he said he had to work and that I had to take care of the children and that other people in Tennessee were taking care of it. And that basically he needed me to pack and take care of the children. Because I had two, two that were pretty young, but then I had the one that was severely disabled I'd adopted and needs, you know, full-time care. And he just said he needed me at home. And he said there was no need for me to go. So, mm -hmm. and if we remember from earlier, uh, he was not a fan of your mother moving in with you two in Florida either. No. Okay. Did you realize this? I have to ask. Did you realize that he would put up uh, a barrier to her moving in with you before you moved to Florida? I knew he didn't want her living with us, but I didn't think what, if it came to that sort of because it to me it felt like emergent situation because mm -hmm. she needed us and you know to me it felt like that i mm -hmm. thought if it came to that she would be able to okay but that's not what happened no okay how once you did get back to uh tennessee how how did everything go with you, you of course you're very interested in finding out uh what happened to your mother uh the rest of your family very helpful um, well, it was pretty much me. Um, mm -hmm. I would just load up my children and I would put up flyers. I contacted all the missing persons. I contacted anybody affiliated with that, that I could. It was, I just did it all by myself. So. Mm -hmm. Your mother have any brothers or sisters, uh, that were alive that could assist? Did they have any insight, anything like that? Um, she had, well, she had one, it was a niece, but that was the same age as her. So we always called her, she always huh. called her like her sister. And, um, mm -hmm. so I called her my aunt, even though she was my cousin, but, and she, she loves mom. She loved my mom and mm -hmm. she was distraught, but not really able to do anything. She did go up to Clarksville and try to look around. She went up there one time, I think with her husband, maybe. Mm hmm and um but that's all i know as far as that and her other brothers i think everybody just you know when it first happened everybody expected her to show up yeah and then when she didn't i just don't think i don't know that they ever really wrapped their brain around it i think they just just like they just still thought she would show up mm -hmm. okay and so everybody just kind of went on with their lives and so i was yeah really out there looking for and trying to do it by myself it does happen in your opinion, given your, not her mental state, but her physical, physical uh, situation with her COPD, your opinion, how far realistically could she have walked? If she didn't, get, of course, get picked up by somebody and something like that happened, but realistically, how far could your mother have walked given her condition? Definitely not 10 miles to the river. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. definitely not that. Okay. Not 10 miles to where the purse was found. Right. Okay. So we can't even uh, maybe even say five miles. What was uh, maybe just you just being around her? What is the farthest you would have allowed her to, to walk when you were around her? Probably not more than not, not more than a half hour. Okay. So half hour, maybe two miles, something like that. Yeah, because not not only did she have the COPD, she was just weak. 
and she'd kind of yeah. like gotten a little bit of a limp and she just she just really wasn't able to mm-hmm. okay let's move on to this being that this came up uh early in the conversation once again you're in the healthcare field and you know it's not a topic that has come up recently on unfound but it certainly has been a topic sometimes and that is hipaa and maybe the barriers and problems that can arise when you have somebody who goes missing and maybe might be into a, gone into a mental hospital or something and you even being her daughter can't find out uh the way um being that you're in the healthcare field you know what can be done about that being that you've been living with this for 18 years you're in the healthcare field now you know are there um you know, loopholes that need to be made or closed or, you know, what can be done about this? Well, I mean, I don't know. You know, it's complicated. There's so many different dynamics to it. And I understand why it exists for sure. But in situations like mine, it really hindered me from being able to do a lot. That's a lot what I was told when I would call from Florida and it, the detective, like I said, my ex-husband told me there was nothing I could do because nobody was going to talk to me anyway if she was in a hospital somewhere. And, you know, I tried. I thought, well, the detective's talking to me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm the only person. You know, I'm her only child. She wasn't married. I have a letter from her that she had written and signed that said everything that she had was to me. Yeah. I thought, I don't know what else I could do, you know, if the detective, I'm the only person the detective is talking to, could the detective not have, you know, been a middleman as far as for that, for them to be able to talk to me. And I mean, I understand the laws and I know that it goes beyond that, but it it was definitely a hindrance because, and they even told me on the phone, a lady told me, she said she could be laying right here in front of us, but unless she is conscious and alert enough to be able to tell us your name and your phone number, we cannot talk to you. And this has everything to do with people's medical records, medical history being private. It does. And even later, I tried to get those and they would not release them to me. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And so that means no one was able to access them. I guess the pair, uh, kind of the irony of this or paradox of this is you can't get her, you couldn't get her medical records. If you call a hospital, um, can't find out if she was in one. On the other hand, though, you could declare her deceased. Yeah. I had to to wait years. Right. I I know you did, but it does seem weird. You can't figure out what kind of health situation she is. If she will, if she were, in a hospital i'm not saying i believe that or there was at the time maybe she was and we just don't know but but on the other hand you can certainly declare deceased and you could be doing that and she could be in a hospital somewhere right i mean theoretically yeah well and the detective you know had to fill out the paperwork for that to happen and you know so it was kind of multiple multiple signatures had to go to court all that for that to happen but so, I mean, it's, it was a complicated process, really. Sure. I had to go through a lot of different signatures and a lot of different people to get that finalized and wait seven years. Uh, why did you finally decide to declare a deceased? If you don't know this, uh, my impression, 270 disappearances into Unfound, is not a lot of these people who are missing have been declared deceased. Some of them have because they do have children and they had considerable possessions, houses, cars, et cetera, that somebody needed to do something with them and that's why uh that happened doesn't sound like that was quite the situation your mother was in how did you come to the decision to do that well there was a couple things a lot of it was just discussions between my ex-husband and me and because i kept hoping that she would be found i was still paying for her life insurance so for those whole seven years you know i paid her life insurance every month and it wasn't very much it was a ten thousand dollar policy basically enough to bury her Mm -hmm. but my husband you know my husband at the time was like we don't need to keep paying this we need to just finalize this and get it over with and get the claim from the insurance so that's really what it was so that's why you did it okay You've told me that you are writing a book about this. Why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about it, maybe what the title is, um, you know, kind of the 
of course, it's about your mother's disappearance, but kind of the way you're writing it and how far you're into it. Why don't you talk about that right now? All right. Well, I haven't titled the book yet, so that's not oh. that's not released yet. I have what? some ideas. Uh, that's um, the best part of writing a book, getting putting a title on it. Okay, because I've written mm -hmm. some myself, so I know. But okay, no title yet. Okay. No. But I, I have a few options, but I haven't definitely decided on what it's going to be yet. I'm kind of waiting until I finish it and just see what really fits once it's done. But I'm probably about a third of the way through it. And really, it's, you know, I, growing up with my mom with these mental illnesses and then you know, I went through a lot of abuse, I went through foster care, went through a lot of that, and I've been able to overcome that. And mm -hmm. so my book is just, it's for people to have hope, people mm -hmm. that have gone through those type of things to know that you can heal from that, you can overcome, you can change your life, and you can rebuild something better. And it's, you know, it's about that for me as a child, it's about me adopting children that are disabled mm -hmm. it's about me becoming a nurse you know becoming a single mom later in life and then be going through nursing school and just yeah. hope it's hope for people to be and able to yeah it, yeah and do you have any idea um when it's going to be done of course i'd love to you can post it in the discussion group you let me know when it's finished and everything but do you have a prediction on when it will be done um my goal is before the end of the year wow mm -hmm. Okay. So like two months from now. Great. Great. Um, do you have somebody that's going to help you? Uh, once again, I only know about this because I've written uh, quite a bit myself, but nothing autobiographical or anything. Uh, I, I'm just not that interesting, but I've wrote, uh, written some, uh, you know, fiction over the course of my life. Do you have an editor? I, you know, how deep are you into this writing process? Somebody you're collaborating with or anything like that? I have some people that will review it you know, and just kind of mm -hmm. go through the editing process somewhat with me. And then I'm just going to publish it myself online. Okay. Well, you let me know when that happens so uh, I can publicize it and so people can check it out. Thank you. Uh, you know, at least tell me when, what the title, of course, you'll probably have a title before it comes out. At least let me know what the title <laughs> is so I can let people to know, I'll let people know uh, to be looking for it, like on Amazon or on their Kindle or whatever else. Okay. Definitely. Um, being that you're writing a book about this, how has this affected you, Connie? Uh, um, how, of course, you uh, have your children, you've adopted children. Um, how has this affected you the last 18 years? Um, hmm. That's where it gets hard. Uh, that's the part that's hard to talk about. Um, like I said, mm -hmm. it's... You know, it's been seasons, you know, at first mm -hmm. I kind of, it was kind of the denial, not really thinking, you know, that she was, that anything had happened. And then when yeah. I really realized it was actually when it occurred to me, when her purse was found, that hit me hard. Yeah. Because then I thought, okay, this doesn't sound like she's in the hospital. So that one hit me hard. And then about a year or so later, I was actually pregnant. And there were people, I had done another press conference, and there were people calling in saying that they thought they saw her. And I got very hopeful of that. Huh. And then um, then that turned out to be a dead end and just kind of shocking the way that that happened. And not long after, I ended up losing the baby. Oh and so just, it, you know, it affected a lot of things in my life. And I got very sick after that, so I kind of had to take a a time off from being able to pursue trying to find my mom. And then when I got my health back, I tried to redo that. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's never ending. You yeah. know, I have found a piece. I believe that she's gone. I know with her health, I know, you know, mentally and physically, she couldn't just survive on the street. I know she's gone, mm -hmm. but to not know what happened. Yeah. And to not, to not know if she was scared, that's the, yeah. Have you bothered to um, maybe look up just at general crime in Clarksville area? I mean, how common is it for maybe, maybe no disappearances necessarily, but people getting picked up the street, being carjacked or being, um, you know, attacked or, you know, have you 
you know, tried to look that up over the last 18 years? Have the police ever, you know, given you an idea of, of course, they would know better than anybody else how street, how safe or dangerous the streets of Clarksville, Tennessee? They were giving you odds on whether she could have been picked up by a stranger. Is that come up? You know, maybe just to something to think about. No, no, not as far as them. It just, it just almost felt like because she was mentally ill, it was like it was just almost expected. It wasn't really, yeah. didn't seem like it was a big deal really to anybody else. Yeah, that does happen. Okay. Do you have a website, uh, Facebook page? I'm guessing you're going to eventually have something for your book, but for uh, your mother's disappearance, you have a website, Facebook page, uh, whatever else you may have, Twitter account, whatever. Uh, if you do, why don't you tell everybody about those places right now? Okay. I don't have anything that's specifically do devoted as far as for my mom, but my website, Overcomers and Him, so mm -hmm. just Overcomers and Him, like what's on the computer behind me, that's my okay. website. And it's just, it's really for me to be able to help, to help people. Okay. To help people that have gone through some trauma. Okay. Overcomersandhim.com. Overcomers in him. So in I him. Am. In okay. Once again, <laughs> overcomersinhim.com. Yes. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Any last words before we complete this interview? Mm. Well, just thank you to you. Thank Very you welcome. for what you do, for choosing my mom, for taking the time to do this. And for anyone else out there that's missing someone, my heart goes out to them. I know that feeling of just not having the answers and just wanting to know they were okay or at least, at least an answer of some sort. And then also for anybody that is willing to even just consider consider if there was anything that they know about my mom. Just... Maybe, maybe I should ask you this. Um, have you chance uh, over these 18 years, have you had a chance to get together with any other family members who've also lost loved ones uh, to disappearances? Anybody in particular in, you know, in the Tennessee area or anywhere else, um, you know, kind of get together and bond and share your stories, share your feelings. Have you had a chance to do that over the years? No, not really. There was the one lady that I talked to that her son had gone missing, and she's the one that had given me the questions to take back to the detective. Oh, okay. And I had talked to her over the phone. But since then, not really. I've just kind of tried to take care of my children. Okay. That's really been my focus. I've focused yeah, on taking sure. care of my children and moving forward. Okay. We might want to think about that at some point. Uh, as I've learned, you know, a lot of the guests who I have on Unfound do know each other. In fact, one will be on and then they'll say, well, you've got to talk to this person over here. And then that person, well, you've got to talk to this person over here. All these different disappearances. Uh, you know, a lot of people do uh, know each other. They do uh, bond and, um, they, you know, of course, just about every state has its own missing persons day. And then they get together on that day and... Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something you want to consider, you know, just as a suggestion in the future. But uh, I do appreciate you being on this episode of Unfound. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. You're welcome. And that was my October 26th, 2022 interview with Connie Diffenderfer, daughter of Mary Cox. I thank Connie for appearing on both audio and video for this episode. I produced a map analysis video that can be now found on the Unfound podcast channel on YouTube. I go over where Mary lived, where she planned to walk that day, and where the fisherman found her purse. And I list some different possibilities as to what could have happened given these locations. The tough part about analyzing Mary's disappearance is that the facts as we understand them do not really narrow down the choices. She could have walked off by accident due to her mental health struggles. She could have walked off on purpose. She could have been picked up by a stranger. She could have been picked up by someone she knew. There's no information to rule out 
any of those theories. Likewise, even if we are to take a look at the disappearances of older people that we've covered on Unfound in the hopes of gaining insight into why people above 50 go missing, that research doesn't help us much either. Why? Well, looking at a sample of them, Robert Wayne Cox, no relation to Mary, there are factual reasons to believe foul play occurred and his wife and others know what happened. David Hardy Jr. He suffered from Alzheimer's and most likely walked away from his vehicle. Jack Hemby. Surely could be foul play, but no facts rule out other possibilities. Dale Karstetter. His is one of the most unique disappearances we've ever covered. Rosemary Rapp. Most likely a domestic violence situation. Most recently, Milda McQuillan, when we covered her disappearance a couple months ago. Theories were all over the place. Foul play, medical event, got lost. And in that way, maybe hers is very much like Mary's. So, and maybe due to the lack of coverage of this demographic, we cannot really draw any conclusions as to the most likely reasons people over 50 go missing. Because the theories for the ones unfound has covered very greatly. Probably the only type of disappearance that we can rule out for this age group is drugs play a role. Because people at 50 years old and above are much less likely to be dabbling in hard drugs because people who do so have a rough time even making it to 50. The other problem is that taking Mary's age out of the equation doesn't make the analysis any easier. If she were 25 living in a home, and also had mental health issues and a breathing problem, would that change anything? Not much. Although my perception is that 25-year-olds are much more likely to be abducted off the streets than 54-year-olds are. Could Mary's mental health issues instead be the deciding factor here? Or should the people around Mary, like Sue Smith, be more closely considered? I guess what I'm saying is I don't have a solid answer right now as to how age affects disappearances, if it does so at all. But I'm certainly going to be looking for cases involving people around my age and older. Then we might come to some firm conclusions on the topic. And that would be golden. I'll leave the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. Right now, while you are in your podcast platform, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, wherever, give Unfound a five-star review, a thumbs up, whatever that platform allows. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've just finished this episode of Unfound.